Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, for the past five weeks, we have been talking about love, and actually the sermon series, the title is Love Is. And I said this week I wanted to have something special for our singles. Amen. Uh, so we talk a lot about married people. And so, so, so with that response, just let me know who all is single in here. Amen. Somebody, hallelujah. Amen. And so there are a lot of singles. Uh, some people want to be single. Amen. Uh, other people are single and they want to get married. And so, uh, but there's a, something that God wants you to know this morning, whether you are single and want to get married or whether you are single and don't want to get married. Uh, some people are single because they have uh, been divorced and they say, tried that, did that, don't want to do that anymore. So I'm, I'm content in who I am right now. Uh, and then there are other people who are still wanting to get involved uh, in a relationship. And so, uh, and so this word specifically will be, uh, for you. And so I'm not going to get uh, as deep as I want to uh, in terms of physical things, and we'll talk about that at a later date. Amen. One of the things that I did say last week is that we were all in some type of relationship, whether you are in a married relationship whether you are part of a family, which we all are, uh, we are all part of a relationship. And through that relationship, God will help you begin to love. He will help you begin to learn the precepts and the principles of loving. Because if you are in a relationship, especially an earthly relationship, the person that you are in a relationship with, in, with will not always act the way you want them to act. Amen. And so and when they don't act the way that you want them to act, you will have to learn to love them anyway. You will have to learn to appreciate them for who they are. Amen? Amen. And so there are some things that I believe God wants the singles to know uh, today. And so we're going to kind of get into some scripture. I've got a couple of points at the end. Uh, and so, uh, but how many know this, that a lot of times if you're dating someone as a single person, before it's over, you'll have to make a decision whether or not you want to marry that person. And what we're going to talk about today are things that will help you to decide whether or not uh, that person is someone that you should marry. Uh, as a pastor, uh, my wife and I get a lot of questions about uh, who to love and how love should look. Uh, and I'm sure that if you are a counselor, you have come across those questions before. And so God wants us to know what love looks like. And so we have spent several weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 analyzing what love should look like. And so God wants you to know what it looks like. But know this, love starts with him. Amen. And so uh, before we get too deep into Scripture today, before I go too far, I want you to know that if you're thinking about dating anyone that is not in love with God, I will tell you today, tomorrow, and the next day, that person is not for you. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm preaching already, and so I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen, but I'm here to tell you if that person does not love God the way God says that you should love him, then you're going to have problems. Now, you can get involved in that relationship as, if you want to, and that's fine, and we'll always be here to counsel you and to help you, uh, and there might be other people in your life that will be able to counsel you and to help you, uh, but I'm telling you from the beginning, from Jump Street, they say from Jump Street, that you know what, you ought to know that if uh, that person does not love God, it's going to be difficult loving you. Amen. So the Bible says this, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. I see some people already standing. So if you guys don't mind, just stand. This will be the quickest scripture reading that you've done all week. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. It says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. You may take your seat. Amen. I told you it was going to be quick. Amen. And so this is the first commandment that God gave mankind. It was to love him. Amen. He told us to love him because he knew there was going to be something very powerful if we could get to the point that we love him. Amen. He knew it would begin to open up our heart to a point that we're now able to love others. 
You can't love others unless you first love him. Uh, and so I, I put that statement out there, and I'm going to back it up bef- before we leave uh, today. And so he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Think about this. God said, you got to love me. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship and someone told you, you got to love me. That comes across as like, what are you talking about? That's kind of harsh. And so God said, in order for your life to turn out right, you got to love me. Amen. And so love in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, comes from the Hebrew word ahab. And so it's an interesting word because it's the word for affection. It describes human love toward any object. It's used when describing human love and family love and any love that you have for any object. And so I just want to quickly remind you because in the weeks past, we talked about the Greek words for love. And so in the Greek, there are four words for love, remember? And so what we're talking about this morning is one Hebrew word for love that encompasses all of that. It's the same word that they use for family love, for human love, and love for objects because we love a lot of things too. And so it is the same word. And so notice, so God says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You are supposed to love him with everything you've got. And so it describes human love toward any object. And so it's a holistic word, and it applies to all different scenarios. So when you say, I love this or I love that, he says it's the same word when you say, I love God. And he says, you're supposed to love me with everything that you have. Amen. Love me as if I'm a part of your family, right? Because it's used for family love. He said, love me as if I'm a part of your family because actually God is a part of your family. You would not be here were it not for God. He says, love me like you love objects, like you love your cars and your homes and your material things, because were it not for him, you wouldn't have any of it. He said, love me the way you love your spouse, because if it weren't for me, you wouldn't have them. Amen. He said, love me the way you love your nation, the way you love your country. God is the one who put you in the United States. Don't you know you could have been born anywhere else? But God saw fit to keep you here. Amen. And every day you ought to thank God for it. You ought to thank God that you're here and not somewhere else. Even though there's a lot of rhetoric on social media about moving, I don't know where I would move to. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so he said, love me. He says, I want your love. How many know you can never go wrong loving God? Notice this. When we read the the Ten Commandments, just put them up quickly. The the Ten Commandments, the first four, the Bible says this, you shall have no other gods before me. He says, you got to love me like that. He says, you shall make no idols. He says, you got to love me like that. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He said, I should be so important in in your life until you wouldn't want to take my name in vain. And then he said this, keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember the scripture says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When you are remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy, you're remembering God. The first four commandments teach us that we should be loving God. The next six commandments teach us how to love others. The first four teach us to keep our mind on God. Can I get amen in here? And so it's all about loving God. And so you can go high, you can go low, but you will always come back to the point that I've got to get God in my life. As a single person, your tireless devotion and energy should be loving God, not trying to find a date. What what you do is You wake up with God on your mind. See, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. It says, his interests are divided. But notice this. It says, in the same way, a woman who is no longer married or who has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. 
This is Paul talking to this same church that we've been spending time with for the past four or five weeks. And this is what he says. He says, if you're single, if you're not married, then you're able to be totally devoted to God. You don't have to worry about what to cook, what to wear. You don't have to worry about what people are going to think about your hair. You don't have to worry about any of that. He says, if you are single, you should be totally devoted. At least you should be thinking about being totally devoted to God. See, married people know what I'm talking about because you have to worry about what people are going to think, what they're going to say, how's this going to look, baby, do I look good in this, do I not look good in this, what are we going to eat tonight, what do you have a taste for? When you're married, how many know, uh, when you're single, you don't have any of that. If you want to eat, you can eat. If you don't want to eat, you don't have to eat. If you want to cook, you can cook. If you don't want to cook, you don't have to cook because you got it like that. Amen. And so there are a lot of married people, they don't want to tell you but they really think about marriage right now. And so there are single people who want to get involved in that, and I am telling you, the Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, you don't understand the blessing that you have in being single. You don't have to concern yourself with any of the things that happen in a married life. Amen. But yet and still, all single people are rushing to get married and to date and to hook up. I'm going to leave that alone. And so the Bible says, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Plainly, he says, you love everything about me with everything you've got. You love me with everything you got. He wants all of us to love all of him. Is this making sense? That's why he said, love me with all your heart and your soul and your might. And so with your might is your strength. So he says, with every ounce of strength you have, you ought to turn it toward loving me. He said, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with every ounce of you, every ounce of your mental capability, he said, you ought to love me. Notice, God is so awesome until he says, love me with everything that you have. Love me according to all the capacity to love me that you have. I will never ask you to love me beyond your capacity, but I will ask you to love me up to and including all you got. When we leave here today, whether you're married or single, I think we all have to ask ourselves, have we been loving God with everything we got? Or are there some things we've been holding back? Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so Luke chapter 10, the Bible says this in verse 25, and this is what I really wanted to get to. It says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law, and how readest thou? The scripture says, and he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Say live. If you learn to love God, He said, there's a promise of life there. He said, you will live. And when you look this up in the Greek, it means he will make you alive. Meaning that if you're in life and you're not loving him, there's something that you're missing out on in life. And so God's love brings life in a way that others cannot compare to. He said, if you love me at the end of the day, I'm going to make you live better than you've ever thought you could live. I will give you a burning flame of life that will never go out no matter what people do, no matter what they say. He says, if I'm the first person in your life, he says, I will control everything else that goes on in your life. He says, you're not living because you are loving the wrong person. Sometimes we throw our love to other people who cannot give us life. And so if you are single, loving doesn't start when you enter a relationship with another person. Loving starts when you enter a relationship with the right person. And so he's the one who wants to give you life. Amen. And so many singles are at home waiting instead of living. You're waiting on a phone call. You're waiting on a text. And you're waiting on a DM. You're waiting on on to be noticed. And so God says, if you love me, you can go home and live life. 
You don't have to sit at home on the weekends waiting. You might be waiting for a call that never comes. You might be waiting for a DM that doesn't come. He says, if you love me, I can give you life right where you are. Amen. Luke 10 says, if you love God, you won't miss out on anything. He says, I will make you and your life alive. Is this making sense? You can have a good boyfriend, but it'll never compare to the love and the life that God wants to give you. You can have a good girlfriend, but she will never compare to the love and to the life that God wants to give you. God's love causes you to stop being lifeless. God's love causes you to stop being loveless. You're like, well, I don't know if anybody loves me. That means you need to get into a relationship with someone who loves and loves and loves and loves and loves. Y'all want to talk to me in here. And so, so you will not be lifeless or loveless when you enter into a love relationship with God. The only thing is you're going to have to put everything you got into it. Because he says that's the only love he wants. God doesn't want part-time love. He don't want a part-time lover. He don't want a secret lover. Some of y'all know where that came from. But, but he wants you to love him with everything you've got, whether people are looking, whether people are not looking, whether you're in public, whether you're in private. He said, with every ounce of your being, I want you to love me. To tell the truth, all of my single brothers and sisters, God begins to send people into your life after he knows you love him. I met my wife after I made up my mind that it's just going to be me and you, God. And, and so, and I began to totally devote myself to God, and then God begins to send other people into your life. But he wants to make sure that you know how to love first before he sends somebody else into your life. Because if you can't love, you're going to make a mess. Amen. So, point number one is that God is first. God says to love me first. That's the priority. So whether you're single or married, when you leave here today, know this. God wants you to love him first. God says who to love first, and the who will teach you how. The who will teach you how. It's going to be very, very important that you learn to love from God. Because if you go to the big who, he will teach you how. A lot of times we, we have determined how to love people from loving other people. And that's how you end up in a mess. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so this morning, God wants to answer your questions about who to love. And after he answers that, he's going to show you how to love. God's desire, as we've already seen, means that he wants you to learn to love him first. His first introduction to your life is the who. Say who. who. You're like, who should I love? Who don't I love? The, he said, love me first. Let me tell you something. When you love other people first and the other people that you love first don't know how to love then that's your definition of love for which you start loving other people now. So, so if you've been loving somebody who's crazy and that's the first person you loved, then all the love that you give other people is going to have a tinge of craziness because you loved cray-cray first. So now, because you didn't love the who, you, you loved the lower who. And when you learn love the lower who first, everything that they give you in terms of love, if you believe that's the definition of love, then that's what you're going to return to other people. And if it's crazy, that's what you're going to return to other people, and that's what you'll expect other people to give you from that day forward. So, so if people are selfish and they're loveless and they are lazy and they get involved in emotional abuse and physical abuse and that's the first person that you love, you might go through life thinking that's what love is. But that's why it's so important that you go to him first. If you go to the who first, then he'll show you how. Because if you go to him first and you get his love, his definition of love, then when you go throughout life, 
That's the love you give. And when you don't get that love, you begin to realize what people are calling love ain't really love. Because you got your love from him first. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so remember, when people say, I love you, they may not know what the scriptural definition of love is. Amen. Because if I say I love you, but I'm still selfish, then that means I really don't love you. If I say I love you and I let you do all the yard work, all of the housework, you help the kids with all of the homework, that means our relationship is based on just all your legwork, then that means there's no teamwork. And that means there ain't no love work. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so love gives. You know, one of the things when I look back and we, we uh, uh, raised our, our kids, and I, I, I even remember when uh, my, my parents were raising me, they always tried to keep me out of boyfriend-girlfriend relationships. I remember being in middle school and seventh grade and eighth grade. How many know that there are seventh graders and eighth graders that have boyfriends and girlfriends? And how many know seventh grader, eighth grader don't really know how to love? So one of the reasons we tried to keep our kids from those type of relationships is because they really didn't know how to love. How are you going to say you love somebody and they still chewing bubblish, bubblish is bubble gum? <laughs> Halfway going to school. Y'all don't want to talk to me. They think that clothes is more important than going to school. They think that their look is more important than an education. That ain't love. And so, and if they don't know love, that means they can't love you. And so even though you got peach fuzz growing on your, your upper lip and, and, and your, your body is developing, that don't mean that you're growing, and that certainly doesn't mean that you know what love is. And if your first experience with love is in the seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, before people understand the concept of love, that will be the love that you give. My heart goes out to young folks who are accepting a watered-down, baseless definition of love. They are accepting anything because someone says, I love them. And the thing is, God should be your first priority. He was the person that when you say, I love somebody, it should be him because he wants to develop you in love. Amen. And all of my brothers and sisters and they get involved in crazy relationships. Some of it is just crazy. That's the only word that I can, I can think about. I, I got some other words, but I, I don't think I can say them. It's crazy. The things that you go through in the name of love. Amen. And you're like, are you that crazy in love? That you're willing to put up with everybody doing everything? Is this making sense? Love has standards. Love has some boundaries. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so the reason is sometimes people just don't know how to love. Amen. And as my kids got older, let me just finish. As my kids got older and got involved in relationships because it happens, I remember when my parents were raising me, I got involved in a relationship, and, and, and you go through all of the emotional baggage that comes from relationships, and you're like, you should really be going through this in a marriage, because even when two people become one, there are going to be some things that you're going to have to work out. But at least you have the background of a commitment and a marriage license. Some of the stuff you're going through unnecessarily because you're just in a relationship, you're, you're going through all of this at 22 when you should be totally devoted to God. You, you have all of this extra stuff going on in your life. And where now you want to sit in the room in the dark and close the blinds because you don't think anybody loves you anymore. And so something is skewed with your vision because God loves you. He always has. He always will. His love never stops. So if someone says they love you and their love stops, it don't mean it wasn't love. Is this making sense? Y'all got quiet on me in here. And so that means you're thinking about some stuff, and that's good. 
And so love never fails. That's what the scripture says. So number one, God is first. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 10. And the Bible says this, and he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. I can't tell you how many times I read this scripture before I actually God began to talk to me a little bit more about Scripture. And that's why it's good that you have an opportunity to read Scripture, because when I would first read the Scripture, I thought there were two things there, that you love God and that you love your neighbor, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, lo- lo- uh, uh, all mind and soul, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. And I thought, okay, because Jesus was asked this question by a Pharisee. A Pharisee said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what does the Scripture say? And this is the response that came back. Notice this. He asked one question, but he got two, two answers because some things are just connected. So he says, love God with everything you've got. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute, there's something else there. Boy, you've been missing this. So it doesn't say love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. So before you can love anybody, you got to love God first. And then the second person that you must love is you. Because the scripture says, Anybody else that you love is going to come from the same degree that you love yourself. Now you see why people treat you the way they treat you. Could it be that they really don't love themselves? The scripture says, love God. If you love the who, then he will teach you how. And... The how will be formulated in your spirit to the degree that when you go and choose the next who, because the big who will teach you who else to go after, then you'll have an idea of what the how should look like. Is this making sense? See, the second thing was to love your neighbor to the same degree that you love yourself. Amen. God first, you second, neighbor third. Amen. See, we're to love God emotionally, mentally, intellectually, with everything that we have. And then he begins to make deposits of love in us where we can first love ourselves and then love other people. So let me say this. You can't love anyone unless you love God and yourself. The most important relationship in life is not your interpersonal relationships, but your intrapersonal relationships. Interpersonal relationships means how you get along with other people, but intrapersonal relationships means how do you get along with yourself? It's not out there, but it's in here. And But we spend a lot of time, we focus a lot of our time on getting along with other people. You're like, well, Pastor Randy, are you telling me that I need to be selfish? I'm telling you, you need to grow you. You need to love you. And in some cases, that may mean you might be a little selfish because you're working on you. As a single person, you need to be working on you, not other people. Love God first, love you second. Is this making sense? The most important person you should want to love is not others, but you. Amen. You have got to love you. Isn't this something that the average person doesn't really even know enough about themselves to love anybody? You don't know enough about you. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Instead, they become what other people want them to become. Since you don't know what you are supposed to do and you don't know who you are, People just give you any type of robe and tell you to wear it. They give you their picture of you and tell you to wear it. And you don't have any other better sense than to wear it because you don't know you. Amen. So people wear the images of other people that are placed on them just like a change of clothes. 
So when you go around this person, they give you this change of clothes. You go around the next person, they give you another change of clothes. And you don't know who you are. Oh, how we would know who we are. Amen. But you'll never know who you are unless you go to the who. Because he's the one that will begin to tell you who you are. Because you can't live life based on other people's expectations. You can't live life allowing society to create what you should be. They give you their self-concept of what you should be. And so you should have your own picture of what you should be. You have your own picture of what you look like. Is this making sense? Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so loving you means knowing you. You can't love you unless you know you. Self-knowledge is the key to all relationships, beginning with your strengths and your weaknesses. Self-knowledge. You need to know about you. If the Bible says love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, then love your neighbor as yourself, then you need to do a little bit of work of knowing you. You need to know your strengths. You need to know your weaknesses because that's all a part of loving yourself because there will be some things you need to work on. Do you know King David was not able to build God's tabernacle because he had a weakness that he never got checked? Do you know that people in Scripture let their weaknesses get ahead of their strengths? Samson had a great calling, but he had a great weakness. And the great weakness affected his great calling. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so, but when you begin to analyze you, you need to know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. That's part of loving you. Some men, you don't need to be around certain ladies. Uh-oh. Some ladies, you don't need to be around certain men. That's, that's part of loving you and that's part of knowing you. For, for the sake of what you're, who you say you love and for the sake of God still loving you, you, you know who you should be around and who you shouldn't be around. It's like, yeah, they went around and I started smelling that perfume. Just, I think of that perfume I gave them six years ago. No, 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 no. You, you need to run like Joseph. <laughs> Y'all don't want to talk to me. The most important person for you to love is not other people. It's you. Amen. So before you can talk about loving your neighbor, you got to talk about loving you. Amen. If I love me or you, I can't love you unless I first love me. Amen. Notice this. If I love me and you don't love me, I'm still loved whether you love me or don't love me. If you want to withhold your love from me, I'm still content because I love me. I'm not basing who I am on the love that you give or the love that you take away from me. I loved me before I met you. And if you leave, I'm still going to love me because I loved me before I met you. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. The same measure that you love other people, you ought to love yourself just like that. If you're going all out for other people, you ought to go all out. For you. That's the only way. That's the degree that you give. Amen. And so the same measure that you love yourself is actually the only measure that you can give other people. Is it more important that people love you? Is it more important that you love you? It should be more important that you love you. Matter of fact, when anyone tells you they love you, don't respond by saying, I love you too. Girl, he said those three words. He said, the, I love you. I, oh, I know I got him now. I know I got him now. I love you. And so, and he couldn't even finish saying, I love you before you said, I love you too. When someone tells you, I love you, you ought to ask them, don't say you love me. You ought to ask them, do you love you? I love you. You say, do you love you? Because if you don't love you, you can't love me. This, this is all a facade. 
Because if you don't love you, it's impossible to love me. According to Scripture, the Bible says, love God with all your heart, mind, will, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you don't love yourself, you can't love me. So that means when you told me that you loved me, you was lying. I heard something that Bishop T.D. Jake said years ago, and it always stuck with me. He said, he's never counseled a man who loved himself that he was still hitting his wife. Meaning, you can't love yourself the way you should love yourself, and you still keep hitting somebody. And the reason people hit others is because they don't want to hit themselves, but the reason they hit you is because there's some breakdown in love on the inside of them. And, and that's how they end up giving love. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so that's the problem when you're looking for love from other people. You're looking for love from people on your job, your supervisor. If your supervisor don't love himself or herself, they ain't going to love you. They ain't going to appreciate you. They ain't going to affirm you. If you're looking for someone in a relationship to give you love and they don't love themselves, they, don't, they can't love you. Is this making sense? You are wanting someone to validate you. You're wanting someone to affirm you. And so the affirmation has to come from God. Amen. That's why people are so easily manipulated. Because you're so hungry for love. In John chapter 4, Jesus met a lady. She was going to get water by herself. She was going up to this well. He met her at the well. They began to have a conversation. The conversation entailed uh, him being a, a prophet. She said, behold, I, I think you are a prophet. He said, I am a prophet. He said, go get your husband. And she said, I ain't got no husband. And he said, thou has rightly said that you don't have a husband because you've had five of them. And the one you have now ain't your husband. She had an inner love problem. She was thirsty. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Some of my young brothers and sisters, my singles, they're, they're thirsty. Could it be that she was going to the well to quench a thirst that could never be quenched unless she went to the who? Your, your, your thirst will never be quenched unless you go to the who. And you can go in a relationship and out of relationship and in a relationship and out of relationship. You can be just like her. Y'all don't want to talk to me, but can I be real just for half a second? I have known people who have been in and out of five and six relationships in 18 months. Y'all don't want to talk to me. That, that's how fast, because you never give yourself time to heal and to love you. Is this making sense? And so you're in a relationship, it lasted nine months, and now you're out. You were out of the relationship for 34 days, and now you're back in one. And I'm saying, time out. You have to deal with some collateral damage that's been going on. And you're going to have to evict all this other false love that came and how it made you feel. You're going to have to control that thirst. Oh, I, I, I'm going on. I'm going on. If you have someone who does not love themselves trying to love you and you are so emotionally dependent and starving for love yourself, you'll take anything. You'll take anything that they dish out, and now your relationship is all jacked up. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You need counseling, need a doctor, need the hospital. Because there's a lot of things that goes on behind closed doors. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And when you get into a relationship looking for love, you're opening yourself up to being controlled and manipulated. Because if you're starving for love to that degree, that means if they give you a little love and they see how you respond to it, then they know they got you. And men know. And we live in the in 21st century now that women know too. They're like, oh, I got him. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Because he's starving for it. Maybe he was a late bloomer. 
And, and maybe he didn't do the things that other kids did when he was younger. Now he's trying to experiment. And now she's like, oh, yeah, he, he wants my love. Oh, I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to go too deep, too, too, too deep into that. But, but I think we all know, because this is something that I learned years ago, and I think it still holds true today, that there are a lot of ladies that give sex for love. There are a lot of men who give the words, I love, for sex. But, but you've got to know what true love really is. And you can't determine what true love really is from the person that you're in a relationship with, especially if they are not saved. So I asked who all the singles were, and y'all shouted out, but there are a lot of married people in here too. And if married people were honest, when you got into a relationship with God on your side, both of y'all were saved. It was still work, and it's still going to be some work. And it's going to test love. Amen. But controlling and manipulating is not one of the adjectives in 1 Corinthians 13. It it never says that love will control you, and love will manipulate you, and love will hit you in the eye, and love will push you down, and love will talk down to you, and and love will make you end up in the hospital, and love will. No, it never says that. It says love is patient. Love is kind. Love love doesn't puff up. It doesn't vault itself up. And so it says love's got your back because it never fails. It hopes all, believes all, endures all. Love never fails. If you are single, that's the type of love you should be looking for. Is this making sense? I had talked to the Lord, and so the, the Lord kind of gave y'all a break today because I, I, I was like, do we want to kind of talk about some of these intimate things that go on? He said, no, nah, don't do that. He said, I want them to have a good day today. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so let me end with this. Five ways to know if you're involved in self-love. Self-love is a result of self-discovery. You must discover yourself first or you'll never love yourself. You got, you, you, you got to discover who you are. You got to discover who you like. You got to love you. Is this making sense? There, there are times that uh, I have gone out on uh, business trips uh, and my wife wasn't able to go. And if I went down with some colleagues of mine, some other guys, and they went out and went to some places that, that I, I didn't want to go or they didn't even call me to go, uh, do, do you know I don't sit in a hotel room and sulk? If I want to have a meal at a restaurant, I go to the restaurant. And when I go in there, it feels kind of awkward at first because they say, party for two? And I'm like, no, party for one. And, but I'm content going to the restaurant by myself because I love me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. If, if, and if I wanted to, if she wasn't available, I could go to the movie by myself and have a good time by myself. Because all I need is the movie and the popcorn. That's it. I'm good. Because I love me. My happiness does not depend on you. Your happiness should not depend on somebody else. When you get married, this is the type of person you should be. You're not going into a relationship or a marriage hoping that somebody loves you to the next level in your life. You ought to go there being who you are. Is this making sense? So self-love is the result of self-discovery. Self-love is the result of self-source. So you have to discover who you are, and you also have to realize who you've come from. Who is your source? Let me give you a hint. It's not your mama. It's not your daddy. It's, it's, it's the big who. Right? So, so you are his child. So, so that's the part of self-source. You, you got to know from which your source, where you came from. God cares enough about you to have you here. He cares enough about you to take care of you. Is this making sense? So, so I am from a good source. I'm from a good stock. I'm from a good lineage. Is this making sense? That's what helps me love me. Do you know if you start loving yourself too much, somebody's going to say you conceited and that you're arrogant. 
right? And sometimes they do that to kind of knock you down so that they can control you. Like you think you all of that and this, that, and the other. You ain't all of that. You're, you're like, you can't tell me who I am. Hello? If I want to wear a suit today, I'll wear a suit today. If I want to wear a brown vest, then that's me. That's, that's just who I am. Well, I don't think he ought to wear that brown vest. Do you really want me to tell you what I really think about what you think I should wear or not? Y'all don't want to talk to me. Is this real life? Or is this, is this? You got to know you. You got to know you. This is what I like. Amen. Because I come from good stock. Self-love is the result of self-worth. You have to know your source, discover who you are. Your worth is determined not by man, but from God. He gives you your worth. You are suffering from other people's value of you because you don't remember who you came from, where you came from. You got to realize that you are worth it. And stop getting your value from people and things. That's why you got to have all the name brand stuff in your closet. That's why you got to drive a car, a new car, every four years. That, that's why you got to have, you, you, you go into debt trying to buy expensive watches. Because you get your value or your worth from things and not the big who. Because if you fall in love with him first, he'll teach you how. All the other things, he'll teach you. Yeah, you can get that, don't get that, get that, that don't get that. And so sometimes it's, it's, it's just... It's just God. Is this making sense? Say, I'm worth it. If you're watching us online, say, I'm worth it. You got to know that you are worth it. I don't care what anybody says about you. I don't care how they talk about you, how they talk about your dress. They talk about what you drive. They talk about what you wear. You got to know that I am worth it. I'm worth it. And you're not going to degrade me. You're not going to bring me down. Your words, it's just like Teflon. They hit me, they keep right on going, right? Because I know that I'm worth it. You may be envious. You may be jealous. You may not like me, but I like me. So me liking me has nothing to do with you liking me. I love me whether you don't love me or not. Is this making sense? Because when you leave, I'm going to still be here. Amen. Self-love is the result of self-esteem. Esteem is how much do you estimate yourself, your cost, or your worth. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, will, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. How do you estimate yourself? Is it way down here or is it coming up? Because God wants you to know that you still are the head and not the tail. You're above only, not beneath. You're blessed going in, blessed coming out. That's the way he's called you. That is your worth, and that's what gives you your self-esteem. It's not being braggadocious. It is just, this is the way God made me, and I'm getting ready to walk in it. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And my self-esteem is so worth it to me that if you keep wanting to bring me down, we're going to have to I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I can't be in a relationship if all you want to do is keep bringing me down. Talk about what I'm not. Because you want to dress me. And you want me to wear your clothes. It won't work. I'm me. You got to know your true value or else you'll sell yourself cheap. And you sell yourself cheap just so you can have company. Company ain't worth you losing who you are. Amen. Because if you're looking for company to keep you from being lonely, it ain't going to happen because they, they ain't going to be there forever. I love me enough that if I'm by myself, I ain't never lonely. Where does that come from? It comes from the Scripture because the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if I feel lonely at my house, I tell God, you there with me. In fact, I'm married, but I have just as much fun in the house by myself than when I have my family there. Because if I turn on my music and I want to dance, y'all don't want to talk. Hey, ain't nobody there to tell me you dancing off. Oh, I don't care. If I want to anoint myself and lay down and then get back up and say, God has refreshed me. I can do it. Ain't nobody there. Y'all don't want to talk to me. 
That's the advantage that single people have. You can just run around and dance and you can do whatever it is you want to do in the privacy of your home because ain't nobody there but you and God. <laughs> Boy, this is good. I'm going to get this tape myself. When you realize how much you are worth, you'll fall in love with yourself. Ain't nobody got like you. If you go to the who and he gives you his love, that's it. See, this is going to be good for singles, but I think some married people are going to be able to take this too. Amen. Amen. When people want to give you their concept of you, you're like, "Uh uh-uh, I don't fit into that picture. I don't fit into that portrait. I'm me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, So when you go home this evening, I'm done. Look in the mirror and say, I like you. And if you really, really, really love yourself, you're going to be like, and you look good, too. You're like, y'all don't want to talk to me. And, and, and so you say, I like you. And, and, and if you're having a difficult time getting there, put some, put some stickies on the, on the mirror. I like me. I love me. Don't matter who else likes me or love me. I love me. And this is part of my growth. Because I love God. See, we don't have a problem telling God we love him. And we dance and shout and attend services and, and, and watch online. But our issue is sometimes loving ourselves because we say we love ourselves, but sometimes we really, really don't. Think about this. Jesus never spoke negative about himself. Other people did, but he didn't. He's like, man, I'm bad. I mean, I don't need nobody. He, he, you know, and he started talking about who he was. I am the bread of life. I am the sheep gate. I'm the water. I'm the bread. I, I'm the resurrection. I'm the truth. I'm the life. All the things we say, I don't know if I want to tell everybody that. He's like, boy, boy, if I really told you who I was, it'd make you even matter. He never spoke negative about himself. So why are we? Jesus never accepted anyone else's opinion of himself. If you don't know who you are by now, go to God because he's got something to tell you. That way you don't have to accept other people's opinion about you. Amen. You're like, well, so-and-so gave me some good advice. Well, if that's fine, take their advice, take their opinion. But I think you know what I'm talking about this morning. Amen. One of the most. We can preach this and it's, and it's easy. It seems easy. But one of the most difficult lifestyle decisions that you will ever have to make is to say, I love me even though people don't love me. And even though people want me to be like them. And when you're not like them, you're going to make people mad. But you still say, I'm me. And you got to accept me for who I am because I ain't cussing, I ain't sinning, I, I just have my own personality. I'm me. Is this making sense? And to begin to live your life outside the dictates of your mama and your daddy and your auntie and your grandma and even your pastor, to be you, it's going to take some big steps on your part. But you'll never be happy unless you love you. As a pastor, I have that kind of sense. I want you to be happy, and the only way you can be happy is to love you. I want you to love you, and I want to love you right where you are. Could you be better? Yes. Could I be better? Yes. Could we all be better? Yes. But we're going to love ourselves right where we are. You don't look like you looked in high school. None of us do. You're not a 32-inch waist no more. And you hadn't been for a while, so you might as well go ahead and purge all that stuff out your closet. You may not be going back that way. But wear your 36s, your 38s, and be happy with who you are. Is this making sense? You came here with 2020 vision. Now your vision ain't 2020 no more. And you're trying to hide the readers from people. Go on and just put them on. You can't even see the menu. 
It's funny, the older we get, when we go in restaurants now, and I'm like, if they put us at the wrong table and it's not that much light, I'm like, Lord, have mercy. It's just a sign that you're getting older. Which is all the more reason that it's time to love yourself. You ain't got much more time to love yourself. You might as well love yourself now. Is this making sense? And stop trying to please people. You'll never be able to please people. They're, they will always want one more thing. They'll always want one more thing. And then when you try to please this person, when this other person comes into your life, you're going to start all over again. You're like, I just can't do it. And don't feel bad when you can't do it. Close the door after you say no and still smile and say, you still bad. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. Because I want you to get your life back. The Bible says, if you love him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, he says, I'll give you life. You can't live the life that God wants you to live underneath other people's expectations of you. You ought to have your own expectations. Let me lead you in a simple prayer. If you're looking online, just repeat after me. You could be at your home, uh, in the car, wherever you're watching this, uh, this morning. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come as a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I confess all of my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I would accept Jesus Christ, he would come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. Father, I thank you for the relationship that I now have with you. And I ask you to take my life and do something great with it. In Jesus' name, amen. While your heads are still bowed, Father, we thank you for those who are here, for those who are looking at us online today, oh God. We ask that you would do something in our lives. Make us better than what we are today, God. We ask that you would give us the love that we need to have in order to love ourselves today, oh God. That you would help us to look at ourselves introspectively today, oh God. Anything that's not like you, we ask that you would help us to remove it today, oh Lord. We want the remainder of our life, the rest of our life today, oh God, to be what you would call us to be, Lord. And we just thank you and we praise you today for all those who are under the sound of my voice today, that you would be with us even as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. For those who are looking online and those who may be here this morning, if you are, sometimes we get questions about how to join. If you want to join the Impact family, that information is uh, on the screen behind me. Uh, we're all about wanting you to know who Jesus is and to make his love known among you and throughout your family, throughout your children, your children's children. Amen. Amen. So if you're here, please see a palace keeper. If you're watching online, there's information on our website that you're able to go uh, and click a couple of buttons. Give us your name, information. We will send you out some information about our church uh, and you can become a member. Amen. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Impact Community Church is located at 4400 Northwest Expressway, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the Cole Community Center. We would love to have you come worship with us. Our service time is at 1030 a.m. on Sundays. We pray this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like to sow into the ministry, we have three options for you to give. You may go to our website at www.impactcc.org, text to give at 405-266-5020, or you can mail a check or money order to Impact Community Church, P.O. Box 121, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73101.